Yeah. You wish you could say it like me? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to be like you. Uh, I want to be just like me. <laughs> I don't want to be nobody else but like me, baby. God made me one of a kind. Mm. Yeah. What's good, guys? Back with another video. We being silly. How y'all doing? Hopefully you're doing great. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And let's just dive right into this video. All right. What we got? So, we got the very revealing Margaret Singer interview. Must Singer. See. Singer. Planned Parenthood. Y'all know we did the CBS one, but this one looked like this was the one that was more detailed interview that she was, um... I hope you guys can hear me better since I'm holding this mic until we get, um... Until we, we're about to switch it up. Yeah, get the other ones, but yay! All right, uh, let's do it. Where do we even get to? Think the way they do. Good evening. Good evening. What you're about to witness is an unrehearsed, uncensored interview on the issue of birth control. It will be a free discussion of an adult topic, a topic that we feel merits public examination. My name is Mike Wallace. The cigarette is Philip Morris. When Mrs. Margaret Sanger opened the... She looked like a haunted house over there. Yes, she did. I'm like, is that her real self? <laughs> yeah. Crip keeper. Scary. The first birth control clinic in the United States back in 1916, birth control was a dirty word. The police threw her into jail as they were to do seven more times during her crusade, a crusade that still faces the reasoning but unalterable opposition mm. of the Roman Catholic Church. That crusade kept Mrs. Sanger away from her children for long periods. It helped to break up her first marriage, and she suffered constant harrowing social abuse. Mrs. Sanger, in view of all of that, let me ask you this first of all. Why did you do it? I realize that you had an intellectual conviction that birth control was a boon to mankind, but I'm sure that others have that conviction too. And so what I'd like to know is this. What events, what emotions in your life made Margaret Sanger a crusader for birth control? Well, Mr. Wallace, it's hard to say that any one thing has made one do this or that. I think from the very beginning, uh, I came of a large family. My mother died young, 11 children. That made an impression on me as a child. Mm -hmm. I was a trained nurse, went among the people. I saw women who asked to have some means whereby they wouldn't have to have another pregnancy too early after the last child, the last abortion, which many of them had. So there's a number of things that are one after the other that really made you feel that you had to do something. There are some other possible reasons that suggest themselves on reading your, biogra your biography by so, Lawrence Paul, later. So what she's saying now that she is starting off the story by saying, based off of her upbringing, a big family, so her mom died at a young age, plus there were other women, probably white women, who were having kids and not wanting to keep having kids. Yeah. So this is where she started to develop the idea of, okay, let's go ahead and have some form of birth control. Mm. This is what it sounds like. Your mother, as you say, died prematurely after bearing 11 children. She was born a Catholic, was she not? She was born a Catholic, yes. And your, In Ireland. your father was a sort of a village atheist who clashed with church authorities. And because of his atheism, his earnings dwindled under community pressure. You and your brothers and sisters were known as, quote, children of the devil, end uh -huh. quote. Could it be then that in part at least, you were driven emotionally toward the birth control movement because of antagonism toward the church, because that was a way to fight the church? No, I don't think I had anything of the kind in mind. I was, uh, I was what I would call a born humanitarian. I don't like to see people suffer. I don't like to see cruelty, even to this day. And in nursing, you see a great deal of cruelty and unnecessary suffering. At that time, there was no opposition as far as the church was concerned, any church. It was mainly the law, mm -hmm. the federal law and state laws that one had to, uh, to think of. The church was not in my mind at all. Well, in going after your motive then, 
and I will press you just a little bit more about that and then get to the specifics of this evening. But in your motive, in the movement, is it possible that the movement itself, the feeling of wanting to do anything that you felt was important, that perhaps that moved you a good deal? Because the fact remains that you led a movement against overwhelming pressures that stemmed back for centuries, and in doing so, according to your autobiography, you even left your first husband. And you wrote this to a friend, Mrs. Sanger. You said, where is the man to give me what the movement gives in joy? Something tells me that she ain't always be truthful about what she say because bang on her movements. Soon she get it thinking. That I always mind for when you got to... I'm listening. ...and interest and freedom. Now, what was this joy, this freedom that you craved? Well, I don't remember that letter, who <laughs> it was written, but I think that it was not uh, a question of, uh, uh, of marriage at all. There was a, a certain satisfaction in uh, doing something that was going to alleviate the sufferings of women in particular, and I was quite a feminist at the time. Mm -hmm, obviously. And, uh, yes, and uh, uh, I naturally didn't want to see women take all the suffering of childbearing and her pregnancies. So it was a pleasure in a sense to think that you were striking uh, at an archaic law, which it was. Mm -hmm. It's put it on the statute books by Anthony Comstock some years ago. And uh, no one had stood up against it. No one had, had uh, tried to, uh, uh, to change the laws. And at that time, not even a doctor had a right to use the United States mails and common carriers for books, for learning, for anything that he had to do with this question. It was considered obscene. The whole question was obscene, considered obscene. Mrs. Sanger, you have helped to spread the birth control movement not only here in the United States, but in Europe and the Orient as well. Why? Why is birth control of such vital importance internationally? Is it just to save women suffering? Is that the only reason in your mind? Well, not entirely. The population question is a great concern today. And the, the rate I'm saying, look at her movements. Mm -hmm. Everything requires her to, uh, 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 you know, and I remember talking to this, um, he was a chiropractor, but he studied something. And then he said, whenever you continue to, or depend on the direction you look, or you make your movements, let you know if there's a possibility that you could be um, just thinking, or it's a possibility that you might be fluffing. Not telling the whole truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At which uh, the birth invited. And uh, I didn't spread, go into the country myself. I was invited to go to Japan and uh, uh, to speak there, have eight lectures on the question of birth control and peace. Hmm. Well, do you believe that birth control is essential if we want to keep millions of people across the world from starving? Is that your thesis? Say it again. Do you feel that birth control is essential to keep millions of people across the world from starving? Well, I think the birth control, if you keep your population uh, more or less static until you pick up your resources, uh, certainly you'll keep them and prevent their starving. Well, what's more important, birth control or picking up the resources? Well, picking up the resources, is, uh, there's just a limit to that, too. There's just so much to take Japan. And she cannot feed. They've had the best experts come there when MacArthur was there, mm -hmm. and the best experts would say that they have 20 million more people and they can feed. She's got to be fed outside and some, in some way. Mm -hmm. She's got to have that kind of help if she's going to keep from, from fighting. Okay. But certainly around the world there is, uh, there is potential agricultural land that is not being properly used now. Just this past year, on May 21st, the New York Times summarized an important study of the world's food resources made by Professor James Bonner of the California Institute of Technology. Professor Bonner says the world is not using one billion acres of potential agricultural land, and he adds wow. that if this land were used and present agricultural land were improved, the entire world could be fed adequately, even if the population increased by one-third mm. in the next 50 years. Wow. Oh, Mr. Wallace, you hear so many fantastic things of what can happen, what may happen. Uh, this and that, I've heard it for the last 30 years, any rate, of what could be done, but it's never done. And the thing is, what is it now? What have we got today? A very distinguished woman spoke to me about Arizona. 
And she said, I wish you wouldn't talk about population. She said, all the population in the United States can be put in one state. And I said, what state? She said, Arizona. It's actually Florida. I said, did you ever hear of Caliche? She didn't know that I was talking about a delicatessen or, or what. Mm -hmm. I said, well, Caliche is harder than any rock. And it is about three inches below the ground where it looks beautiful. It looks as if you could have food. It looks as if you could have corn or wheat or cotton. But as a matter of fact, you have to dynamite caliche out of the ground in, in order to well, have a little shrub, have you know, <laughs> a little grass mm -hmm. or a few flowers. So many problems that, uh, when it comes to that. And the demographers, I never heard of anyone that would agree with that, that we could have another uh, in the world. Another third. Another third. Another third. No, see, she just... She's all for the baby killing, so she ain't trying to hear it. But technically, from what I learned, look up the square footage of Jacksonville, Florida, mm -hmm. and then count how many people in the world. Okay. Well, you don't I want saw, complete I saw, square footage of how, the population. I mean, The population of the planet Earth. Yeah. You could take everybody and fit them. You can take everybody and fit them onto one state. If everybody was there... If you put everybody, so right. when somebody side say that, by oh, side, squinched up, no, con no, no comfort. Who wants to do that? No, but you're not listening. When they say no, the planet is overpopulated. It's no way oh, overpopulated, and nowhere close, and nowhere ever will be overpopulated. Okay. Well, you say that originally the opposition was in all law, and you have to fight against that. Today, your opposition stems mainly from where? From what source? Well, I think that the opposition. Uh, is mainly from the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Of the Church. Well, now hierarchy. Of the hierarchy of the Church. You feel that the, the parishioners themselves, the lay people in the Church, are not against birth control? I feel they come to all of our clinics just the same as the non-Catholics do. Oh, wow. Exactly the same. Well, let's look at the official Catholic position, opposition to birth control. I read now from a Church publication called The Question Box. In forbidding birth control, it says the following. It says, the immediate purpose and primary end of marriage is the begetting of children. When the marital relation is so used as to render the fulfillment of its purposes impossible, that is by birth control, it is used unethically and unnaturally. Something I did find this woman is evil. 